when we're talking about things like, how does he do this? We've got to come back and realize the starting point a little bit. This idea of what God's doing. He's crediting you with who you are. So I want you to see, we've talked about this before. I want you to see this. This is the biblical journey of human beings, right? All human beings. The first thing is in the garden. I'm using the book of Isaiah because the book of Isaiah, 730 BC, well after the book of Genesis, 1450 BC. But in one book, God takes us all the way through it as he's describing for us the imminent destruction of Jerusalem by Assyria. And he starts out in chapter 59 saying, the reason you're separated from God is because of you. <laughs> it's you. It's not me. It's you. This is hard. We in church will, will do what we do. Well, they don't care what God thinks. You do. You think you care what God thinks? I don't. I can tell you multiple times throughout the day, I don't really care what God thinks. If I did, I wouldn't do the things I do. <laughs> you, you follow me? So the first thing we have is the fact that he's imputing. This is a word, whether it's in the Hebrew or the Greek, what literally means it's a financial term. It means that he is crediting me, my account, with who I am. I'm crediting you with offending me. <laughs> That's what he does. He doesn't cause you to offend him. He merely credits you with that. You guys good? Everybody out there, whether it's a drag queen at a local bar that you and I are talking about, or it's the Lee Summit R7 School District where they castrate some guy for talking about a book that's being taught in our public libraries because the board approves it, or it's a hockey player in the NHL because he doesn't want to wear a certain type of gay pride with his team, is getting castigated for being a hockey player, or it's a Christian in church sitting next to someone harboring hatred for his friend he's sitting next to because he doesn't like him and wishes he wasn't sitting next to him. They're all the same to God because of who we are. <laughs> so what happens is then he acts and imputes on his son who we are. Jesus doesn't hang on the cross and say, Lord, I'm ready to be punished for adultery. He becomes an adulterer. He is viewed by the Father as a child molester, a liar, a thief, all those things. That's how he's viewed. And he's crushed by his Father for that. So imputing literally means the Father credits the account of Jesus Christ with everything we've done. <laughs> he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us. How do you explain this, right? This is what's happening. This is the situation we're in in our country right now is that we have a Savior who showed up in 32 AD and died on a cross, but this Savior from eternity past before anything was ever created had already died on the cross. Now, do you understand that part? Does that make sense to you? You know, God didn't say, Holy smokes, this world screw up. Hey, son, I got an idea. Would you be willing to go on a cross? I think we could make this work. Let's sit down and talk. Is that how it worked? God's reacting to the world he's created? Before the world was ever created, Christ died on the cross. It says uh, in Revelation, he was slain before the foundation of the earth, right? So what's happening is we don't understand things from his perspective. There is no beginning and end for him. There's just forever. And I don't even think forever is a good description because that's implying time. And I don't even know what time looks like to God. So this is something for who he is that always was. And so literally, 
his son from eternity past already paid for it. So then in Isaiah 61.10, it says, my soul is joyful in my God for he clothed me with the garments of salvation. He cannot clothe a sinner. He doesn't do that. And we just talked about the fact we're all sinners. So how does he clothe me with salvation? Somebody look up Romans 13, 14 real quick. If we can get our arms around this stuff and we actually believe it, talking to a drag queen at a bar is easy. It's a piece of cake. Sharing the gospel anywhere in our culture is easy because we've now come to the point where we understand what he has done in, your, in my life. His name in Isaiah 12, 2 is Yahweh Shua. And that in the Hebrew means the Lord has become our salvation. God doesn't give us salvation. God gives us Christ. He is salvation. I'm the way, the truth, and the life. When we get Christ, we are clothed in salvation. Paul is teaching in Romans to put him on. We, when we surrender our life and he lives in us, we got him on. And, and the only way that can happen is if he imputes his son's righteousness to us. So we're still sinners, but he sees us in his son. And now we're perfect because of his son. This is the difference. This is what Martin Luther discovered, the difference between practical righteousness and positional righteousness. He sees our position, but we know who we really are. People who don't know Christ are practically who they are, and their position is they're at enmity with God. And God is saying, tell them. Tell them what they need. Am I, am I okay so far? You guys following me? This is a big deal. If we embrace that, this is why Paul is able to speak the way he does in Romans in a church that's starting out where Nero is slaughtering people for being Christian. And Peter is saying the same thing, and he's saying worse stuff. He's saying our verse that we use for our apologetics, 1 Peter 3.15. Anybody know that? Remember that verse? 1 Peter 3.15. Always be ready to give a defense for the hope that's in you, right? Talk about in meekness and fear. It starts out with sanctify the Lord Jesus Christ who's up in the heavens with dad. No, it says who's in you, right? He lives in you, in your heart, and it says now with that power, be ready to give your personal defense why you know You'll be in heaven and why Jesus Christ has conquered sin and death. That's apologetics. We teach a lot more in this class because our culture is so screwed up. They're trying to tell us science. Now they're telling us don't trust science, trust feelings, right? Used to be the other way around with abortion, the whole abortion issue before they discovered it's really a human being. You know, well, science says it's not. You can't trust that. Well, now science says it does. Well, it's somebody else's right. You know, so, so everything's backwards. So Christ becomes our righteousness. And now if we want to, that's why the word might is in there in the Greek, we could become God's righteousness. That is literally saying for God's definition of what's right, that can be you. <laughs> How would you like if God looks at you and says, you're right. James even repeats this. He talks about this idea, how, what happened with Abraham. The gospel was presented to Abraham in 1450 BC. This is the gospel. We think the gospel is New Testament. It's not. It's, it's from the very beginning of the Old Testament. You can follow it through. And it's God imputing crediting accounts. So when we ask that question, how does he justify, how does he combine justice with love? It's the cross. <laughs> this is how he does it. He will never overlook sin, ever. 
there is always a price to pay for his holiness. But he pays it. And he does it through what's called credits or imputations. He imputes it. 